I am the law department of this university, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce our two speakers who have come to hear, who have not come to hear me. On my right, I have Dr. Carl Grundy Ward, uh, who is an expert on the boundaries from the University of Durham. On my left, I have Farid Mirbagheri from the University of Kiel, who will be talking about the United Nations peacemaking in Cyprus. Earlier this afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, one of the audience inquired of me whether I was a representative of the British Foreign Office. I'm happy to assure you that I am not a representative of an organization which has made a mess of so much of the world. I leave you now in the hands of your two speakers who will tell you how this mess may be sorted out by the United Nations. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you. Um, I'd like to also thank, once again, uh, Zenon Stavridis. I've given, given him a lot of headaches by firstly requesting slides, and then last night I told him I'd be bringing a, um, a rather large map that I wanted to put up, and I was also going to bring a video, but I thought uh, that's better to do it to get some light, actually, of course. Sorry? We might have to get some light. Yes. Um, well, yes, sure. Yes, yes. Hang on, can I just use slides? I'll be using slides. Ah, that's right. Ah, that's right. Yeah. Um, I am... Uh, I work for an international boundaries research unit. Uh, we are interested in de jure, de facto borders, um, issues of trans-border cooperation, problems created by artificial lines on maps, um, and ways to overcome them. Uh, peaceful means for solving uh, conflict situations, and uh, trans-border cooperation uh, and development in border regions. But that aside, I've had a much, my interest in Cyprus is much longer than my interest actually in international um, boundaries, de facto or de jure. Uh, and uh, it started off with a, a master's degree I did on the geography of peacekeeping in Cyprus, 1964 to 1984. And since then, I've updated my own research material on several visits to the island. Now, I think it's important to put into context um, really what the United Nations role is in Cyprus. I think there's a lot of misconceptions and uh, very different interpretations about the UN role in Cyprus, uh, particularly as regards the UN peacekeeping role, which is very specific indeed. And in the aftermath of the Gulf, Gulf War, there's been much discussion about the future role of the United Nations, more generally, in conflict resolution and as a force for international peace and security. And in recent years, there's been a, an increase in the use of uh, UN peacekeeping. Uh, the most notable recent example, of course, is along the um, Iraq Kuwait border. Uh, and uh, the new speak term there is UNICAR. The new speak term for the UN new speak term, uh, abbreviated term for uh, the United Nations Force in Cyprus is UNFASIT, and I will refer to UNFASIT uh, through most of the talk. So, firstly, um, what is peacekeeping? Uh, it needn't be necessarily a UN function. Uh, although the UN since series in 1956 have developed uh, peacekeeping forces and have been rather successful in uh, formulating operational procedures for UN peacekeeping forces. Um, it's third party, impartial, mostly uh, comprising of military units, um, intervention. Um, but the military units themselves have very unsoldier-like duties to perform, and I'll be coming on to those in a minute. Their main functions are to defuse crisis, stabilize military situations along the ground, um, observe truces and military status quo. Uh, the main method is the, the common one of interpositioning troops uh, from multinational forces between the opposing forces of uh, two uh, conflicting parties. Um, so thereby forming demilitarized zones or buffer zones. A classic example, um, since 1974, of course, has been the UN buffer zone in Cyprus, 
which is detailed here on this uh, on this map. Um, now, there have been very many misuses of the term peacekeeping. Uh, there are many notable examples in the world. Probably a recent one was India using the term peacekeeping for its operations, rather bloody operations in Sri Lanka. Uh, but uh, there's a multinational force you may remember in um, Beirut. Uh, uh, the second multinational force, which was dispatched in September 1982, uh, found itself assuming the role of a participant in the fighting rather than being an impartial third party. Um, and it's important to remember that impartiality is a very great key to the successful operation of a peacekeeping force. Uh, as Professor Alan James, an, uh, an expert on uh, UN peacekeeping and other peacekeeping ventures, has said, there is no halfway house between peacekeeping and enforcement. Any peacekeeping mission which engages in one-sided use of force loses its peacekeeping character. Can I have the first slide? Uh, one, notable, one notable example, of course, of the use of force uh, was the uh, British uh, Army operation in the late 1950s in Cyprus, uh, which uh, you are all very familiar with. Um, and there's no need to go into details here. The primary Having this said that the primary jobs of the peacekeeping force is to defuse and stabilize conflict situations, uh, it is important to stress the political context within which uh, UN forces operate. Um, and uh, this is especially important uh, simply because uh, UN forces are dependent for their success um, in both their, in, their, in their origins and their operational success, on the wishes and policies of others, peacekeeping forces can make a valuable contribution towards peace, but only if, and to the extent to which, disputants choose to take advantage of it. So let's turn to Cyprus. Um, now, in the, if we can have the next slide, when uh, move on, that's a uh, thumbs up, that must be another example. This is um, the situation in Cyprus, which developed after the intercommunal fighting in 1963-64. And I'm sure you're all very familiar with the, uh, uh, the fact that uh, the Turkish Cypriot community uh, found themselves entrapped in their own enclaves, uh, partly for their own protection, partly uh, through the activities of uh, various wild men, um, which Peter Luizos has already uh, made reference to. Uh, and the UN force actually became operational under very difficult circumstances. Uh, probably one of the difficulties was the fact that they actually had to uh, take over from a beleaguered British operation, which had also tried to assume the role of a peace force, um, with all the memories of the uh, late 1950s battles against um, imperialism still fresh in the minds of many um, Cypriots. Now, the interesting, an important thing to remember here in the earlier period of the UN operation 64 to 74 is the restriction of the UN mandate itself. Uh, in, uh, that the force was required to, ask, uh, to act in the interest of preserving international peace and security and to use its best efforts to prevent a recurrence of fighting and as necessary to contribute to the maintenance and restoration of law and order and return to normal conditions. In fact, um, both sides interpreted the UN mandate according to their own wishes. Um, the Turkish Cypriots saw the UN, the UN role as primarily one of protecting them against Greek Cypriot aggression. Um, the Greek Cypriots saw the UN uh, force as a body that would help um, in putting down Turkish Cypriot attempts towards separation. Um, and uh, we've had the same phrase, I think, uh, repeated today. Uh, but uh, a number of uh, Greek Cypriot leaders at the time kept re repeated that you cannot equate a majority with a minority, even though uh, uh, even though they were suggesting that they 
they thought, believed that the UN should act uh, as a, net, a force with, uh, uh, for both communities. Obviously, they had adopted a very one-sided interpretation of what the UN force would be doing. In fact, the UN force adopted its own um, interpretation of its mandate, which in, on the ground has proved to be a very flexible operational response. Uh, it's a, it, youth, youth and, um, is playing the UN role, role as effectively enabling the UN force to be more flexible since it had no originally defined objectives or rules to follow. And so it's, he saw the main role of the force as, a, as an enabling force to assist and enable rather than to enforce any peace. Uh, and in particular in the amelioration of day-to-day -day administrative, economic, social or judicial difficulties arising from the division of the two communities. Of course, in such a complex and bizarre geographical situation which emerged uh, and lasted for uh, nearly a decade, um, there were many on-the-ground difficulties. And the UN effectively managed to to reduce the number of armed incidents from three or four thousand a month to less than ten a month uh, by the end of 1968. Uh, and they did, in fact, achieve this uh, sort of form of stability. I will come on to the arguments that many critics of the UN force have pushed that the UN force have actually uh, helped, by their own success and presence, helped perpetuate an unsatisfactory status quo. Uh, when I deal with the uh, uh, future role of the UN force uh, and in my conclusions after just going to the 1974, post-1974 position Could I have the next slide please? Which was radically different. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the UN operations on the ground, I mean I've spent sort of many weeks um, in, in the buffer zone uh, it's a very peculiar place to go to Cyprus in which to spend your um, vacation. Uh, but in fact, uh, I have been mainly concerned with the operations of the UN force in this whole stretch of territory here, which divides um, the island into two components. The UN, the UN buffer zone, at its narrowest point, is barely 10 metres wide. Then the next slide in the uh, capital city and it is here where the maintenance of um, one of the main functions of the mandate, the maintenance of the military status quo is a major preoccupation of the UN force in Cyprus. Uh, could I have the next two slides? Uh, this is the Turkish interpretation, Turkish uh, map uh, and it's an interpretation of the uh, zone uh, the uh, division. Um, in fact, it varies in various places to the, uh, the official um, uh, alignment of the buffer zone. Incidentally, Greek maps. If you notice, if you visit the, if you you have read a lot of tourist maps, there's a very faint line which goes across the island. In fact, um, this is a, a really great buffer zone which takes up a lot of resources on the island. Uh, it has prime agricultural land contained within it here and here. Um, it has communities, that, uh, that the living communities within the buffer zone, villages like Mamari and Denia um, and Athianu, uh, Petrofani and uh, Pila. Uh, and it has got a very small, but nevertheless it has still got a mixed Greek and Turkish population. Uh, most notably, of course, in Pila, uh, the remaining mixed village on Cyprus. So, it, in geopolitical uh, terms, but in geographical terms, but I'm just still a mixed village. Right. Okay. Um, if I may move on, in geopolitical and geographical terms, then the UN buffer zone is a very important uh, di uh, division. Uh, it's important for the future of Cyprus to understand what is happening in that buffer zone uh, because uh, of the smallness of the island and the need to use resources, human and physical, 
effectively. Uh, it's also important to understand precisely what the UN are doing in that zone. I've spoken to many Greek Cypriots who simply don't know. Uh, I've often used the, the term dead zone is often used to describe the buffer zone, but that is entirely a misconception because there are people living there, there is farming activity there, um, it's, it's, uh, and it's also not a no man's land because people own land in the buffer zone and uh, uh, land ownership rights and property rights, the use of resources are all important issues. Uh, and the UN, of course, on the ground, is actually acting as a go-between between the two communities in uh, effectively helping to utilize the resources of this very important zone of the island. May I have the next slide? Um, uh, we need to well here, this is just a demonstration, a uh, Greek civic demonstration in uh, Nicosia. Can we move on here? Um, move on to the next one. The way the UN have developed um, the resources of the buffer zone is by uh, two main principles, land ownership and security. Uh, the security principle is security to both sides, both the uh, Greek Secret National Guards and the Turkish military positions and security to ordinary civilians who um, work within the zone. Uh, the other principle is land ownership, and where proven land ownership is given, a farmer or farmers, laborers or tenants may work within the buffer zone. And on, my, on a visit to Cyprus in 1984, there were large tracts of land within the buffer zone that were entirely unused, particularly near the um, Turkish uh, army frontline position. Since then, I'm glad to say that um, the farmland now is effectively moved almost to within 200 meters of many parts of the uh, Turkish army frontline position. And uh, the areas of mixed farming have also been extended uh, in the island, in the, in, within the buffer zone area. Can I just can this move on? Um, just to it's difficult for somebody like me who spends a lot of time uh, looking at, uh, dealing with uh, uh, actual field work to uh, explain the complexity on the ground with, with, in the buffer zone. But this is a small part of the zone in the Austrian sector, um, which is sector four, and it's just here um, near an operational boundary of Unfasit. Um, within the buffer zone, and it's a triangular area of land, um, which in fact has been illegally farmed by uh, Turkish Cypriots, that's by Turkish uh, farmers who have been encouraged to move in and plough up areas that were owned by Greek Cypriots, which naturally provoked uh, a minor uh, incident. Uh, the um, Greek, local Greek Cypriot farmers were extremely annoyed about this, they requested the UN to move the farmers out. In fact, what happened was a de facto control area, a very tiny one, of farmland that the, uh, because of UN negotiations between village leaders on both sides, they actually operationally decided that they could, the Turkish farmers could continue to farm that area if uh, the area of Greek farming the Afghanistan was extended up towards the frontline position of the Turkish Armed Forces. Can I have the next slide? Um, this is a Sector 2 area. Um, in fact, many of you are very familiar with uh, Cyprus, um, so I won't go into the uh, description of the sector, but in fact in this area uh, too, there's the whole area, a large tracts of it now are farmed. There are unused fields where farmers don't want to go in. Uh, for various reasons to cultivate those plots, but the UN has been very successful there in extending farmland. Can I have the next? Um, this uh, shows um, the complexity of water resources across the um, buffer zone. Uh, without uh, the UN reassuring local populations, all sorts of incidents can occur on the ground because one side or the other uh, claims 
that um, they're not getting their full water supply quota or that the water supply is being deliberately polluted. Um, and uh, the UN, thanks largely to the presence of UN soldiers in the area uh, and UN humanitarian officers who have to liaise between the villages on either side, that a lot of these disputes are completely, um, well, if they arise, they calm down very quickly. Um, but fortunately, um, the chances of them arising are much less. Uh, I'll give you one example. For instance, um, Greek uh, villagers, uh, Greek farmers uh, near Athenu, uh, Petropani, were complaining that Turkish soldiers in this salient of land here were polluting the water tank. Um, I was there when a UN, uh, young UN officer uh, went to visit the Turkish uh, army officer uh, at that point to negotiate um, uh, with him. Eventually the whole matter was cleared up through a series of negotiations between village leaders, between um, army, uh, local army leaders, uh, and between local authorities on both sides. Let me move to my conclusions, because um, if I continue with fieldwork material, I could go on for the next hour, and I might expire myself by then. Um, the, the United Nations uh, peacekeeping force is actually very limited in what it can do. I mean, it's, it's a misnomer to... I mean, I've heard people blaming the UN force for all sorts of things that it's just not responsible for, and all sorts of misinterpretations about the actual role of the UN force on the ground. I would maintain that um, without the UN force on the ground, the chances of local incidents flaring up and becoming major political and military problems would be very much greater. Um, the UN force has to satisfactorily maintain the status quo, military status quo on the island for a long period. And I think there's now a need to actually change the UN mandate to accommodate a more flexible response to help the enabling process of the UN force on the ground in breaking down barriers of mistrust between communities who have to work in and near to the divide, which in itself is a very important role. Um, as I have demonstrated, uh, the um, situation in Cyprus is still very bizarre. Uh, I mean, the very fact that there are still villages living in Lorigina here, who, to actually get to Nicosia, they have to travel miles and miles out their way to uh, get to the north of Nicosia, because they can't cut across this area here. They can can't go across the road that the UN use uh, directly to the centre of uh, Nicosia. I mean, practically, the actual existence of the buffer zone is not a very sensible um, uh, division. And if there are to be bizonal, if there is to be a bizonal federal solution, then certainly um, there will need to be very complex mechanisms and uh, safeguards. And the UN force, I believe, uh, would need to be present to ensure safety of villagers, to, uh, to monitor movements across the border, uh, to monitor movements across the border, uh, and to um, be in place to prevent minor incidents from becoming major skirmishes or conflicts. Um, if, if we assume that there's not going to be any political change, and some speakers today have taken uh, a more pessimistic line, uh, then the UN structure could be changed by making it less military in character, by increasing the role of the humanitarian and economic operations of the UN force on the ground, um, and also by extending the length of stay of all the humanitarian officers in, the, uh, in UNFISIP. At the moment, only the Australian, Austrian, Austrian contingent in Sector 4, only their small number of humanitarian officers stay on in Cyprus for two years. Everybody else has a six-month rotation. 
I also think that the civilian element of the uh, U-1 facet can be increased. Um, and that if we just take uh, if we just take a look at the uh, actual complexity of the buffer zone, then you must also ask, um, well, what would the situation be without a third party in between uh, and without a, a, an actual settlement? Um, so I see that the UN force is going to be in Cyprus for a lot longer, um, but I do think that its current mandate is restrictive and that given that there has now passed 17 years since the actual partition and the UN have been very effective in achieving a large degree of uh, productive use within the buffer zone, there is now scope actually to enlarge the peace building uh, process between the two communities on either side of the divide. Uh, and um, in terms of security, then UN uh, blueberries are uh, reasonable um, go-betweens between the two leaderships. I'm sorry I'm uh, beginning to uh, run dry completely now, so I will leave uh, for my call, Curry. Speak up, please. UN peacemaking from the session was hampered by the Cold War. This made UN peacemaking rather ineffective because disputing countries prefer to rely on the support of superpowers rather than the United Nations. The two most inflexible and least informal forms of peacemaking are mediation and democracy. The difference between the two is that uh, in mediation, active participation of the third party is involved in the negotiation. In the good offices, there is no requirement for the participation of the third party. Although good offices is not actually mentioned in the UN Charter, it has been employed by the United Nations in various instances. There have been successful attempts of the UN peacemaking, there have been unsuccessful attempts of the UN peacemaking. If uh, the, uh, the few examples, Arab control dispute in 1949, and West Juliana in 1962 were successful in terms of human peacemaking. And successful attempts were Arab control in 1771, and Portland in 1982. There are many factors which affect the outcome of mediation. There are a couple which are absolutely essential. One is the consent of the parties, they have to agree and you will it be uh, in the dispute. We have the exception of Kuwait, of course, recently, but that's far from exception in the world. And second is that uh, support of the Security Council, particularly its permanent members, is essential to the peacemaking process is going to start and is going to succeed. Various concepts have developed. Uh, throughout the period of peacemaking process, such as peace-giving, peace-servicing, peace-breaking. They're all parts of peacemaking, but they're subject to their own rights. Peacekeeping, which Carl was talking about, is a fourth century, because you cannot make peace between two parties which continue to fight. We cannot hear you. I'm sorry. We cannot hear you at all. We cannot hear you at all. Can you hear no, me now? we cannot hear you. Now, only now. Now, okay. I'll try to speak louder. Please. Now, you want peacemaking in Cyprus. I start very briefly with the colonial phase. Greece took the issue to the General Assembly five times to force the United Kingdom into negotiations about the Cyprus problem because the government at the time was actually 
refusing to acknowledge that there was a cyclist problem. The next phase starts in 1963, when Cyprus took the issue before the United Nations. And the forms, the actual different uh, phases, or rather different efforts of the United Nations, I go briefly through them. There was a mediation in the World Rights by Resolution 186, Security Council, 4th of March 1964, undertaken by Gallo Plaza. Because uh, after a year, Gallo Plaza came up with a report that was flatly rejected by Turkey on the grounds that Gallo Plaza had exceeded his mandate and had acted as an arbitrator rather than a mediator. Uh, it failed, nonetheless, it was significant in two respects. First, that because mediation was mentioned in Resolution 186, it indicated the United Nations dissatisfaction with peace peacekeeping alone after common operation. A new peacekeeping of its own was very fragile and they needed a peacemaking process. And secondly, its failure proved that a more flexible approach was required. Then, in Resolution 244, 22nd of December 1967, after the November crisis, uh, good offices of the Secretary General were put in the resolution at the request of the Secretary General. Then we have the intercommunal talks, which uh, began immediately and went on 73 and 74. After the July date of 74, we had the Vienna talks. Then we had the high level agreement, 77 and 79. In 1980, 1981, initiative uh, was undertaken by the United Nations. It was rejected by both sides. Then we had the Gobi initiative. And Gobi was the special sensitive of the Secretary General, in, which actually took two years from January 81 to October 83. That again failed to achieve anything. Then we have the also called the initiative by the present Secretary General, who was the special representative during the 1970s. And that, of course, failed again, and it's acted as a catalyst for the designation of Nigos Rolandes, Cyprus Foreign Minister. We have then proximity talks, which take a situs rejected. Then there was another initiative, this time Greek situs rejected. And then we have the latest one, which failed in February 1990, when Mr. Deitash said that Turkish citizens have to be referred to as a people. And we've got, of course, the current uh, negotiation, which has taken place. Now, factors which have affected UN peacemaking in Cyprus, and in fact have contributed to its uh, not being successful. The most important one was the Cold War. United States' divergence of goals in Cyprus from those of the UN. The United States had two objectives in Cyprus. One was to keep Cyprus within the Western camp, and secondly, to avert a war between Greece and Turkey. As long as these two objectives were achieved, it did not mind what else took place. This was uh, reflected in the Natchez plan in 1964. And of course, the UN objective was to keep Cyprus as, as an independent, non-aligned, sovereign state. Americans did not mind the partition if it kept Greece and Turkey both happy. And uh, we had the United States parallel mediation. In 64, we had Gallo Plaza going, and then we had uh, Dean Acheson plan. In 67, the, there was a crisis, we had Cyrus Ferris. And in, in a way, the parallel mediation of the United, the United States undermined the United Nations efforts. Because the speaking parties said, well, they the the United States, they've got the money, they've got the power, why talk to the United Nations? And Macarius very much resented that. And this, of course, I mean, he was known in some circles as the Castro of the Mediterranean, the Red Priest. Um, and this continued to undermine uh, the United Nations efforts. Of course, another factor was good with Turkish relations. Uh, when the relations were warmer, if they were at all, uh, it had a positive impact on the United States. And their independent action, the Greek stage coup in Cyprus and the Turkish subsequent Turkish invasion, is grossly undermining the United States in Cyprus. Another factor of inflexibility, or some prefer to call it lack of imagination of the two communities. Um, in fact, so much so that Professor Kant, who is uh, a well-known academic uh, about Cyprus problem, uh, if I remember, he said that uh, 
1983 initiative seemed very fair and seemed to solve the Cyprus dispute. Perhaps that's why both sides rejected it. Mm -hmm. uh, so sometimes there's that. I think the Punabi is also raises this point uh, that uh, some one wonders if they're really genuine, they really want this solution. Another factor which has contributed at first, uh, which has uh, affected adversely to the uh, peace making effort in Cyprus was Turkey's and Turkey's secrets bitter disappointment in the United Nations after the Plaza report. Since then, they, uh, they just uh, didn't trust the EU vis a vis Cyprus. The weaknesses of the EU peace making, uh, I'll try to be as good as I can. Well, uh, let me just say briefly that. The United Nations peacekeeping force is very important to peacemaking, as I said, because you cannot make peacekeeping into uh, or through uh, disputing uh, uh, parties that are still fighting. And one of the weaknesses of the weakness of officers, in a way, is the weakness of peacemaking. Because officers have been so successful in Cyprus, apart from one instance, and that is return to normal conditions, that is the only failure of the other than that, it's been able to fulfill its standards. Uh, because it's been so successful, it has taken the edge away from citizens to come up with a solution to try hard. The financing uh, of the has always been a problem. Um, the number of troops from the city city was 6,500 were cut to almost around 2,000 just before 1974. And another factor, uh, weakness of the UN uh, directly responsible, and that was UN failing to exploit at crucial times the, the situation. For instance, it was revealed that in 71 there was a new agreement by Mr. Kilirinas. There is no indication that the UN tried to exploit that. Or I think Michael, Michael Harbour said that in the late 60s there was a good chance for a settlement. But again, the UN did not do anything to exploit it. And lastly, uh, the main weakness of the UN is that it basically lacks the capacity to implement its resolution. Of course, we've got a great example, but that is an exception. For it was a very, very exceptional case. The UN is full of resolutions, not implemented. So, because it lacks that capacity, uh, that, that applies such as well, that incapacity. There are some strong groups of UN peacemaking in Cyprus. Um, first, it keeps the problem alive, it keeps all attention on the Cyprus problem. It's a moral authority, and uh, therefore, because it has the moral authority, it can induce concession on both sides. In 74, November 1974, Resolution 3212 General Assembly, um, it was a unanimous decision that foreign troops should immediately leave uh, the island. And even Turkey voted for this just shows the moral authority of the United Nations. And special representative of the Secretary General, which is in Cyprus, is a very uh, important uh, element because it puts in constant touch with the parties and is a constant reminder to them that whatever they do will not go unnoticed in the international community. Uh, Secretary General himself has played an uh, important part in the 1967 crisis. He played a very constructive and admirable part. And that is uh, another. Also, US, uh, UN is, a, is an international body, the only international body where all disputing parties can have access to other parties. The European community, for instance, is a foreign Because Turkey is not a member. Turkey uh, is not look uh, from the you know, East in the heart of an impartial body. But the United Nations has the unique advantage of uh, uh, allowing access to all parties. Prospects for the future, there are favorable conditions, the cold war is in that. There's a sort of rapprochement between Greece and Turkey, although this does not include any substantive substantial agreement on uh, in Cyprus, there was a process of court in the early 70s between 1970, which did not lead to anything. And also, we have President Vasily, who is uh, uh, much more pragmatic than uh, previous uh, uh, government leaders. These are all important, but they are not sufficient. They are necessary conditions, but they are not sufficient conditions for 
of these chemicals. Um, finally, I'd like to say there isn't a uniform pattern of peacekeeping within the standard procedure. For peacekeeping, there is. For peacekeeping, there is not. And there is a need to establish some sort of mechanism uh, within the UN machinery that can cope. Stay, the various suggestions have been made, I won't go into them, but there's a need to establish some sort of peacemaking mechanism. And my final point is that to say that UN has failed in uh, achieving the settlements to solve this problem, uh, regardless of the influence influences of external powers may give the impression that you don't have the capacity to affect such a settlement. So you know does not such a settlement. That impression is false. Um, it can help, but you uh, can only be what the member states want to do, particularly the major powers. And that's
and where there is a threat to the peace, a threat to world peace, then the Security Council can intervene. The UN Charter specifically allows that, where there is a threat to the peace. So we come back to the point that has already been made by Farid, that if the superpowers can agree, then the Security Council can intervene, as it has done in Iraq. The problem is that the, su the superpowers are not agreed over in Cyprus. The Security Council has not chosen to intervene. Yes, I'm not sure that it's free. It specifically says that, that uh, whenever the Security Council is necessary, it can ask the process to come and that. That has been taken uh, as giving the Security Council the power to intervene, even without the consent of the parties. This, I think, was not. That's a recent interpretation. No, it's, it's, it's clear, it's in the wording of the charter. I'll make you a copy of it. Now, we have a question from anyone. Yes, uh, first of all, I'd like to, to say uh, that even if legally uh, such action uh, by, the, uh, by the Secretary General is not considered um, uh, in you know, a violation of international law, uh, still politically it would alienate the, uh, the two official governments to such an extent that it would undermine the whole process anyway. That's a point, yes. Uh, but then I, 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 I'd have just a small, a short question. What about jurisdiction in, in the buffer zone? Did I miss it? Did you say anything about it? Did I miss it? Or I, I would have liked to have obviously spent a lot of time on this. Um, within the buffer zone, the United Nations um, peacekeeping force have uh, in fact is effectively um, a UN controlled piece of territory in as much as the UN um, have to monitor who get uh, monitor the people who get farming permits uh, within the area, they have to monitor movements in, into and out of the area and they can actually stop any activity that they consider to be um, against the security of either side. So in, in actual operational terms, um, you could describe the zone as UN, um, UN controlled in that sense. No court. Sorry? No court. Um, what about, you know, no, in terms of incidents, well, the UN have a civilian police force and they deal with uh, incidents occurring within the buffer zone. Uh, but of course, um, they have to, uh, where a matter falls between, uh, whether, whether it's a, a say, say it falls between two stools, whether it's a, it can be interpreted in some cases as a, a matter for the southern authorities or the northern authorities, the northern police uh, uh, legal administrations to deal with, then the UN will have to you know, in, mediate between the two. But with an actual incident within the buffer zone, then the UN civilian police force acts as a, an ordinary police force would do, and um, uh, then, then liaise with either side. So the case of a Greek Cypriot against another Greek Cypriot would be referred to uh, the, uh, the, the court of the Republic of Cyprus. Yes, yes, uh, quite. What about, what about the case with the secret made in the Well, then... It, I don't mean the, you know, the case, that major thing that you, uh, in the Austrian uh, sector that you told us about. I mean a small minor thing like, you know, a few yards from my um, farm, for instance. Right, and right. And I, the Turkish secret, would I take him to what court? Yes, uh, that's... And according to what laws? Well, that, that um, obviously would then uh, be dealt with by the courts in the South uh, if it was, say, a murder or something like that. But the UN, or if it was a minor incident, the UN would usually step in and use its authority in the buffer zone to uh, and not refer to the uh, legal process in the in, in the south, but you've got to bear in mind that where the buffer zone actually lies, the buffer zone, the actual ceasefire line, the Turkish force ceasefire line, is actually the northern line. And so a lot of the matters that arise within the buffer zone, if it is to go to the courts, will go to the south. Um, if it's a case of Turkish Cypriots moving into the zone, then it will go to the north. 
Um, and so, um, it is very, you're right to raise it, it's an extremely complicated issue. But a lot of minor incidents are dealt with immediately by the UN without recourse to legal processes. Yes, well, thank you. still exists, um, a quite a separate little buffer zone uh, here, uh, the UN um, troops between uh, the Turkish fighters and the uh, Greek uh, militias. Uh, and um, in fact it was an extremely complicated arrangement, but they were effectively uh, 
um, an island, it was an island wide, oper an island -wide um, operation with regional headquarters in each of the main districts, um, with the main concentrations wherever there was um, an outbreak of conflict. But what happened to them? In, you know. During the September 1974, did yes. they stay in the north? Or no, they, they were quickly. Um, I mean, for operational reasons, they could. There was not much the UN force could actually do to prevent um, the Turks. Uh, well, no. to prevent a major movement of any uh, armed grouping. Um, it was in fact a very small force. Um, so the only the way to use the for their forces effectively uh, was in fact to quickly interposition themselves uh, and demarcate um, the area uh, which you see today. Um, so immediately from, you know, within the space of a few months, they become, from an island-wide operation, they turn into a, a classic buffer zone operation. And who are they protecting now? Uh, they're protecting people who work in and near to the, to the UN buffer zone. With that, they're not partially protecting either the Greek Cypriots or the Turkish Cypriots in the area. Um, and they, um, for instance, uh, uh, Athenu is very close to the Turkish front line here. And so in this area, they will be mainly protecting Greek Cypriot farmers working in fields around here. But there are also Turkish Cypriot farmers uh, in some mixed farming areas uh, around here, there's some mixed farming areas, and so they'll be protecting Turkish Cypriot farmers also in the zone. So I mean, it works both ways. I mean, they're not being partial to either one side. Surely the answer is that they're protecting the Cypriots from themselves, really. I mean, oh, very good. I mean, I mean, well, the point I've been trying to make is that if, if there are incidents, then obviously there's going to be a flare-up, and that's not particularly pleasant. Yes. I'll use your phrase from now on. <laughs> may I just say, may I take a pedantic point, actually? Can I just ask one more question? Um, I think you already had one. And I saw one hand raised here, and then we must go for tea, because I'm getting frightening signals from the door. Uh, Rula, could, you, could we have your question? Yeah. Hi. You mentioned that the breaking of negotiations sometimes depends, or it could depend, on the peaceful relations or the quality of relations between the two countries. And here we are talking about uh, mainly one problem, that is the Cypriot problem. But on the other hand, there is a serious problem uh, about which very few times I read anything in the English press or in any other press. And that is the very serious air by, uh, violation of the airspace of Greece from Turkey's uh, either air, uh, mainly air force actually. And this is a problem that keeps the Greek nation on its toe all the time. Every time I visit Greece, there is a very, very serious upheaval, uh, not only in the government, but also the people the Greek people becoming aware that they have an enemy, which is really what the, do the Turks want to do? Uh, the obvious answer is to break our nerves. So one problem is the violation of the airspace. Uh, and actually, I know for certain that in the newspapers, uh, the violation is not always mentioned because the government sometimes wants to keep it a uh, secret. I don't know for what reasons. Uh, the second uh, major problem for uh, Greece is the threat which there is in Thraki or in Thrace in the north of Greece from the Turks. Because every time the Turkey wants to bully not Greece, but I would say the United Nations, they say oh, that the Turkish army will invade uh, Thraki or Thrace and therefore they will take a very a part of Greece. This is not really schizophrenia. Uh, it's a very, very serious problem. I wonder if the United <coughs> Nations are informed and about all this, and if they are, what do they really do? Uh, I can assure you they are informed. What 
they do? Um, well, that's <laughs> yes. uh, it's a serious question, Dave, because... Yes, but if you see, United Nations gets loads of these complaints every day from all the states all over the world. Uh, it's not only a Greek sort of Turkish violation of Greek airspace. Uh, it's a problem that they have. They've got problems over the international shelves, the GDC. Um, yes, the, I'm trying to relate the question to uh, the societal problems I'm having. Yes, um, that keeps the Greek nation on the turf, so they won't be, I don't know, able to. Because yeah, exactly. It's a serious problem for uh, the internal stability of Greece because the, the enemy is there, but in, in my opinion, uh, it's not a threat just from the Turks, uh, it's a threat that comes from the Americans in a way for the bargaining position that the Americans got to do and therefore the United Nations ignore, in my opinion. I mean, I'll briefly say that, yes, all these issues, they are related, <coughs> the GNC, uh, they are related to Cyprus problem, but it's an intricate thing, I have uh, no time for me to go into the oh, Right. Well, as chairman, uh, I must inform you, I have the pleasure to inform you, that tea is now served. Coffee is served. Yeah, then we leave that one.
Is that what you mean? And check. And communication can only take place if you have feedback. And feedback is very important. So when the leader of the Turkish Supreme Opposition, Moscow Oskua, said, um, we can only talk when we meet, and if we, if we meet, then we can agree. He was absolutely right. You can't do it without this process taking place. And this process can't just take place at the top of society. It has to take place between people, um, not at the bottom of society, I like to say that, but between all Greek, Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots. If they can't meet, then they can't understand each other, and they're going to live with their own internal mythologies. And this is, a, is criminal because I believe, looking from the outside, that Turkish Cypriots and Greek Cypriots have more in common than they have with either their mainland parents, if you like to put it, or with um, anybody else, really, because they live in that space. And I'm not being romantic about it, but when you meet them, you can see that there are positions and postures and, and things which people take up um, when they're outside in the real world that they dissolve when they get into a conference setting. So that's uh, useful, and I've seen it happen. We did a conference in Camden, we then had a situation where we said, right, now why is it we have to travel all this way to talk to each other? Can't we do it in Nicosia? And we were very lucky that just at that time, just as a coincidence, the Nobel Prize was given to the United Nations Peacekeeping Force. And they decided that they were going to celebrate it by having an open day in the Legion Palace in Nicosia. They had this open day and people met. And we got in contact with the United Nations and we said, can we do the same thing? Can we bring people together in Cyprus? And we did that, and they had a conference in Cyprus. And I set a precedent, I think, for things which have gone on since. And that is that people are talking and they're discussing. And the shame of it is, is that the National Union Party and the Turkish Cypriots have not taken place, taken part in these conferences. But I don't think that that takes away from the process. It just means that they lose out um, on the understanding which they would gain um, if they came to the conferences. They did come to the conference, the Friends of Cyprus ran in uh, 1986, but they haven't been since. So, what I, I want to say, this, um, this parallel um, in the divorce of heart and head, um, a, the divorce between the reproductive and the caring, sharing, the supportive, the looking to the next generation, and, and the productive, militaristic, um, uh, territorial maleness. These, these divisions are not helpful. What we need to do is to involve community. We need to involve people and we need to get young people to meet each other. We need these confidence building measures and I think these should be encouraged and I don't think there's any excuse for not encouraging them unless you don't want a solution. If you want a solution then you need people to meet. If you don't want a solution then, then if people meet, then it's obviously going to get in the way because they're going to find out that the things that they thought about the other community are perhaps things which can be resolved. And I was very, very impressed with the women's meeting. It was uh, showing the film of Women Walk Home. It was in Islington Town Hall. I think some of the people here were there. Um, women who had seen things and heard things in Cyprus and had absolutely no reason for wanting rapprochement, for wanting to live together. Um, there was a Greek Cypriot woman whose father had actually been killed in front of her uh, by a Turkish Cypriot who said, if I can live with, with Turkish Cypriots, everybody can live with Turkish Cypriots. If I want a solution, everybody should want a solution. There was um, a woman who told about her mother and all her male relations were killed in Tokni and, and they said, but we know the difference between our Greek Cypriots and the Greek Cypriots who went ahead and did that because it's unacceptable. So when Mr. Durduran at our conference in the Legion Palace in Nicosia said that what we have to do is to make sure that the norms that we apply within our community are applied to things which happen across the community, he was absolutely right. And I think that people can only understand the norms that they apply in their everyday lives within their own community, apply equally across the community, is when they meet. So I think this is a very important thing. I don't think the Friends of Cyprus is now necessary it was more like a community worker facilitating role, which we did. But now there is a possibility, and occasionally people do meet, um, and they have built up their contacts, they're coming to Camden to talk. Um, but I think this facility that's available to journalists or to politicians should be available to everyday, ordinary people, because that's the only way that you're ever going to get normality back into Cyprus. 
And I remember Turkish like, Cypriot woman who actually sang Greek Cypriot lullabies to her child because she didn't want uh, the culture to die away. The felt that she felt a Cypriot, so she she sang these lullabies. Um, she had been goaded by people within her own community and said, "But remember the past. Remember what happened. Remember what the Greek Cypriots did to us." And she said, "It's because I remember the past that I never want it to happen again." And Eric Fried, somebody that I read about only after he died, said that you can't pass evil on like a baton in a relay race. You have to take some responsibility for stopping, for recognizing that things were wrong and people did things that you would never countenance if they happened to people within your own community. And say, right, that's it. Sorry. It happened. It should never have happened. And it won't happen again. And when people decide that, then there will be a new Cyprus, and that's my vision, and I hope that you can go along with it. What Larry said is very important. She said that part of the problem can be found if we get to know its other. That is very true, true on a community level. What I find very disturbing is the fact that in order to find a problem in such a very complicated situation is that the big powers, and I say that euphemistically because the big politicians should not be the, be the big powers, the people for which the solution is found should be the big powers, anyway. The politicians should get to know about the problem. Uh, and when I say politicians, it should be the American president, British, however is involved, or really the UN. And I am sure, in, the, in, in, in honesty, that they really don't know what the problem is. That's why they don't want to find a solution. Thank you. I'd also like to Oh, it's not because I'm another woman at the city, but I think that such points of view are not discussed in conferences of this kind with a lot of time in front of us to see how we are going to educate the community.